One of the things that I like to do with a question is to try and look at how we can figure it out with the minimal amount of knowledge as possible. Right? Which means lots of critical thought all the way up to kind of stagger through it. Right? So to start this question off, we have to know what vapor pressure is. Right? Possibly. Right? How many people have a solid definition of vapor pressure? Isn't it the, uh, the pressure that um, gas above, like directly above a liquid pushes it's down onto the liquid? the pressure of the gas above a liquid. Right? So it's a measure of the ability for the liquid to become a gas. Okay? That was one person that raised their hand. I'm going to assume the rest of you didn't raise your hand because you didn't know. Is that a fair assumption? OK. So <clears throat> could we reason our way through this without knowing that information? Yes. When do we use pressure? Okay. Pressure is only discussed when we talk about gases. So this must be asking about gases, right? So we look at the rest of the question. And it says, based only on intermolecular attraction, predict which of the following liquids. But pressure is used for gases. Okay, so what must that then be referencing? Vapor pressure must have to do with the ability for the liquid to do what? Turn into a gas. Turn into a gas. What measures the ability for a liquid to turn into a gas? The boiling point. So really, we can repackage this question. Instead of looking at vapor pressure, we can look at boiling point. Do you all know what boiling point is? Mm -hmm. right. There's at least some more than one person head shaking yes. So OK, boiling point's easier to work with. We do need the qualifier, that highest. Okay. What would a highest vapor pressure mean? Okay. And pressure was gas. So really, what the question is saying is, which of these has the highest gas? What would that mean? The one that's easiest to turn into a gas. How do we measure the ability to turn into a gas? Boiling point. So what boiling point would be easiest to turn into a gas? The lowest boiling point would be the easiest to turn into a gas. Because if it's a high boiling point, that means I have to put in lots of energy to get it to turn into a gas. So really what I'm asking for is, what has the lowest boiling point? Right. Well, what dictates boiling point? What is breaking when I do a boiling point? I'm breaking the forces. Okay. So a boiling point is about breaking forces. Okay. If I have a low boiling point, how would I describe those forces? Why should they be weak? They're weak forces. They're easier to break. Less heat goes in. Okay. What would be my easiest or weakest force? It would be a London dispersion force. Okay. London dispersion forces come from what bond? Kind of except covalent, mainly because that's how I've written it up there, but you can do better. Nonpolar covalent. How do you know you have a nonpolar covalent bond? Um, C. C to H and C. same to same. So what can I now do? I can look at each of those compounds. I don't even have to look at forces, because I've actually boiled it all the way down to what is shown. What's shown are the bonds. I need to see carbon to hydrogen, and same to same. If I see anything other than those, am I nonpolar covalent? No, which would mean stronger forces. I want the weakest force possible. Okay. What do we see in A? Carbon to hydrogen. Carbon to hydrogen, that satisfies our rule. Carbon to oxygen. That would be polar covalent. That does not satisfy our rule. Okay? 
So that answer right out of the gate would probably be a bad answer. That doesn't match the nonpolar covalent. All of that thought process I put down and wrote down does not match answer A. So A is probably wrong. How about D? I don't know why I picked D. I meant to say E, but we're doing D now. How about D? D is in dog. There's a lot of carbon to hydrogen. Carbon to hydrogen, nonpolar covalent? Yes. Are there any other bonds in D? There's a carbon to chlorine. That Cl, is that same to same as that carbon to hydrogen? Which means? Probably wrong. E. E is an elephant. What is E supposed to be? Echo. Echo. Thank you. I like elephant. E is an elephant. <coughs> There's a random sulfur in there. Is carbon to sulfur same to same? No. Is it carbon to hydrogen? No. Which means? No. C? Carbon to oxygen. Carbon to oxygen. Kind of not a fan of this one, and this gets a bit unfortunate. That oxygen looks an awful lot per and particularly because it's buried in the middle of the structure, that oxygen looks an awful lot like kind of a C, right? So it could be easy to lose track of that. When you're being asked about intermolecular forces, make sure you very carefully reference each formula and identify those things. Okay? This is where you could go through and highlight anything. So if you got a highlighter for the test, use it. And you could highlight to draw attention to those things that stand out. You're like, ah, that's probably important. And you look at it. I have an oxygen to carbon. Is that same to same? Is that carbon to hydrogen? No. Which means? Probably not. probably not that answer. So I can look at B. And what do I see in B? Only carbon to hydrogen. Only carbon to hydrogen. Which would mean? B is my answer. I am a huge fan of this question. Okay. This requires some pretty deep thought. All of that writing has to be processed through. Even if you know what vapor pressure is, you still have to be able to tie that to forces. Okay? And know that that needs to be weak forces. And know that those weak forces need to be nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay? This question, you can't get away with just saying, oh, it's this answer. Okay? Unless you just blindly guessed. You have to think through and reason through all of those intricate pieces. That makes it a challenging question. It makes it a question that students often don't like. But this question, more than probably any question we've covered this semester, is the epitome of what you should be able to do at the end of this class. OK? Yep. Questions about it? OK. So with 10 minutes in, we've given enough people enough time to show up. I think we're good to do the uh, extra points back. Sound reasonable? Yeah. Okay. You can have out whatever notes you would like. Oh, sweet. Solubility versus miscibility. Ultimately the same concept. So don't get kind of too bogged down in those words. Those words get thrown in there so that people get confused by the English language instead of by the chemistry. Okay. Solubility is referring to the ability for anything to dissolve in a liquid. Anything. That can be a solid, that can be a liquid, that can be a gas. All things. When they dissolve in a liquid, that's referencing solubility. Miscibility is more specifically the liquid to dissolve in a liquid. Okay. Why? Uh, why do we have squares versus rectangles? Okay. It's the same concept. Okay. We just have a refinement behind it. Okay. The rule of thumb that you are responsible for is like dissolves like. I personally hate that phrase because it's too ambiguous. What you should be adding to that is like forces dissolve like forces. Okay. That statement in and of itself should give you a lot of big hints as to what you need to do to solve these kind of questions. What should you be doing? You need to identify the forces. So all the stuff that we did for boiling point, melting point, phase changes, identifying bonds, you do it again. So you have to look at a formula and determine what those forces are. Okay. What else do you need to do? Isn't that what you're doing by looking at your forces? 
What do you mean same? Well, I've, I got hydrogen bonding. That's my force. Can I do solubility yet? No, why not? Like forces dissolve like forces. Compound A, compound B. All solubility questions are asking you about two compounds. You have to identify the forces in each of those two compounds. Sometimes the question has that content hidden and buried from you, or when you look at it, you're like, oh, it's just one thing. Solubility by definition is two things. Right? So it is twice as difficult as a melting point. Right? Because you have to evaluate the forces for two separate compounds. So if we go through and look at our first example, water and ethanol. Don't worry about the names. What is the force that you see in H2O? Too long. What is the bond that you see in H2O? It is a polar covalent bond because we have a hydrogen to oxygen. So it is not ionic because they're both non-metals. Thank you. That's, I was paused for that dramatic effect. Thank you. All right. I don't know, my brain just decided to stop. <laughs> uh, water, non-metals. <laughs> not ionic because they're both non-metals. It's not non-polar covalent because? Because it's, uh, it's not same to same, same or, carbon or carbon to hydrogen, which means we're polar covalent. A polar covalent bond has, has what kind of force? Dipole, dipole. If we have a dipole, dipole, what should we do? Check for hydrogen bonding. Check for hydrogen bonding. Do we have hydrogen bonding? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It is that stepwise process that you should be thinking about and moving through when you evaluate your forces. Okay. So ethanol. What do we see there? Carbon to hydrogen. Okay. So we could jump carbon to hydrogen. Oxygen to hydrogen. And oxygen to hydrogen. Carbon to hydrogen is what? Nonpolar covalent. Non covalent, which leads to? Uh, Lenin dispersion forces. Oxygen to hydrogen. Dipole, dipole. I don't accept dipole dipole yet. Oxygen to hydrogen. Polar covalent. Because it is a polar covalent bond, I can now ask what is the force? Dipole dipole. Dipole dipole. Since I now have dipole dipole, what can I ask? Do I have hydrogen bonding? Yes. Yes. Is hydrogen bonding the same as hydrogen bonding? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Welcome to spring break. So those are missable? Those would be missable. Those of you who aren't old enough, maybe you'll figure it out later. Okay. Just, yeah, you, if you don't get it, you weren't old enough, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out later. Okay. So those are missable. They mix. What about the next one? Move to the right. What are the forces in water? Okay, we could be going through polar covalent, and I'm okay to be dealing with that process all the way through, but theoretically, water, we should immediately be jumping to. Why should we be making that jump so fast? You've done it a lot. Okay? So you should theoretically be able to make that lip. lip. Jiminy. Jump. The other compound? Nonpolar covalent. Non covalent because these are all carbon to hydrogen. Nonpolar covalent means London dispersion forces. Are London dispersion forces similar to hydrogen bonding? Well, is black similar to green? No. So they don't mix. Okay? Should it be non miscible or immiscible or insoluble? It's a really hard question, because to be able to differentiate that, what would we need to know about each of those substances? We would have to know their phase. Do you know the phase of water? Yeah. Cool. Do you know the phase of that compound? No. Do you know how to name that compound? No. So if you don't know the phase, don't use a miscible. 
okay, or miscible because you, you don't know that information. You should be using soluble. So in this case, they would be insoluble. Okay, kind of make sense? Okay. Ionic compounds still fall under the same kind of logic. They get a little bit trickier because if we went through and looked at the ionic compounds down below, for instance, H2O, our force would be hydrogen bonding. What would our force be in sodium chloride? Ionic. Wow, you made that jump fast. How'd you do that? It's a metal and a non-metal. Metal and a non would be ionic bonds, and ionic bonds have ionic forces, which we stupidly call ionic bonding. Okay? So is puce, I think it's puce? I always get puce backwards. I think, actually I think puce is, yeah, whatever. Yellow, green, the same as red? No. No, so what would you say? They're not They would not dissolve, is that true? No. Ooh, they do dissolve. Okay. Why does water dissolve the ionic compound? What is special about the ionic bond? It splits into ions. Why is that helpful? What is attracted to that positive sodium? A negative. Is there a negative floating around somewhere near in water? The oxygen is partially negative. Why? Because it's a polar. It is a polar covalent bond. I'll accept that. Why is the oxygen partially negative in that polar covalent bond? It's for sharing the electrons. It has to do with the ability to share electrons marked by electronegativity. electronegativity. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element, so it is generating a very large partial negative. That interaction is still weaker than the sodium chloride interaction. If it's weaker, it shouldn't form. Why the hell does it form? Are we forming just one interaction with water? No. no. And what we end up getting is a solvation. That molecule gets surrounded by water molecules. The sum of those hydrogen bonding ionic interactions is enough to overcome it. Okay. So we run into kind of a slight gray area when we look at our ionic compounds. Okay? For the most part, if it's an ionic compound, it dissolves in water. What's another name for an ionic compound? S salt. And what do we know about salt? It dissolves in water. So use your physical knowledge to apply that information through. Does that mean all salts dissolve in water? There are different types of salts. How would we know if it dissolved in water or not? So we could try and apply electronegativities. Silver chloride has a large difference in electronegativity. This compound does not dissolve in water, even with that large difference. How would I be able to know that silver chloride does not dissolve in water where sodium chloride does? Silver is part of the exceptions to the chloride solubility. solubility rules. How do we decide our ionic compound solubility? Use the solubility rules. Okay? So when we're talking about miscibility, solubility and miscibility, we're looking at covalent compounds mixing with other covalent compounds. That's our primary driver for these. The ionic compounds dissolving in water is something else you're also responsible for. But you're responsible for knowing that is found in the solubility rules. Where would you find the solubility rules? They're on the test. So you just have to flip to the part of the test that has them on there, and then you have to use them. What is the format of the solubility rules? The exact same format that you've seen in your textbook. Okay. So know how to use that. You're good. Okay. So, apply like dissolves like to predict which of the following liquids is miscible with water. What do you immediately see as far as structures? A giraffe. Fair, I see it. In the question. 
right? In theory, you see five different answers, right? So if we're being asked about solubility, we need to compare those five structures to each other, right? What are we comparing those structures to? To water. Does anybody see water clearly shown as a structure in the question? You might say, well, kind of. It says water, but it doesn't give it as the formula. You're required to be able to interpret the English language to recognize that we're saying water is H2O. Because I know I'm looking at H2O, what is the force? Hydrogen bonding. Because I'm being asked to apply the like dissolves like rule, okay, to predict which of the following mixes, what do I need to find in my answer? Hydrogen bonding. How do I know I have hydrogen bonding? Oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine bonded to hydrogen. Does that show up? Yeah. Done. Make sense? Okay. It is a lot more complicated in, than that, but we don't have to worry about that. So, ta da! Questions? I promise you don't have to worry about that. In this class. So only for the next, like, week. And a couple hours. A week and a couple hours. Because the exam ends at 2.50. Acids and bases. Okay. Which of those is an acid? Okay. This is where we run into weird kind of gray areas. This is Chem 130. We give you a rule set to explain what is an acid. What is that rule set? It has to have a hydrogen. That's a four, so CH4. And what was your other rule? Aqueous. Has to have aqueous. So these guys, none of, nobody's saying are acids, right? That's not correct. Remember our rule set. You have to use our rule set. For it to be an acid, it has to have an H, and it must say aqueous. Do those first two say aqueous? No, so they do not satisfy our rule set, which means they're not acids. Don't name them as acids. Okay. H2SO4 AQ. Does it have an H? Yes. Does it say AQ? Yes. Is that an acid? Yeah. Yes. CH4. Does it have a uh, hydrogen? Yes. Yes. Does it have an AQ? Yes. Is that an acid? We got a really confident yes right out of the gate. And then we had some other people being like, uh, maybe backed off their answer because of the confidence in that yes. What is our rule for that hydrogen? hydrogen must be in front. The hydrogen must be in the front. Is it true? Ops of frequent no. Okay, but that's what we're working with. Okay? The hydrogen has to be in front, which means CH4 aqueous, not an acid, because it does not have that hydrogen in front. Why do we place the hydrogen in front? To point out that it's an acid. To point out that it's an acid. It's literally the only reason we're doing it. Right? When we move through more chemistry, we start to realize the relationship between structure and function. And now we don't have to use an arbitrary rule of placement of atoms. We can use other rules to predict why something is acidic or not. Right? But at this stage in the game, all we want, hydrogen in front, aqueous in the back. We now have an acid. Okay. Why do we give it a different name? Because when we did naming, what were the, the categories for naming? Okay, you said a whole bunch of them. I'm just going to say you got them all. Okay. Acids was its own category. Why do we give acids their own category for naming? If I had a container of acid up at the front and a container of water at the front, and you were asked to stick your hand or told that you had to stick your hand in one of them, what are you going to stick your hand in? Water. Why are you sticking your hand in the water? Because it's not an acid. Why are you so afraid of acid? It's going to melt your hand off, really? Has anybody drank a soda within the last 24 hours? Some of you are like, hell no, I know what's in that. Yeah, there's acid in that. Okay. There's acids in a lot of different places. 
we've associated the word acid with dangerous. Why? Because there are some acids that are really dangerous. And if I ask you to stick your hand into a vat of acid, it melts off. Right? That's how we turn into villains, right? Like two people got that one. Okay, good enough. I must be Marvel fans. So, when we think about acid reactivity, right, they tend to be sticky feeling. Why are they sticky feeling? They're melting your fingers. They're melting the skin off of you. That's why they're sticky feeling. Okay? They tend to be sour tasting. I don't know why they're sour tasting, but that's just how we've responded to them. So we can come up with ways to classify these so that we have some information behind them. Okay. We also found that we could take another clear liquid and stick our hand, and we get the similar response. It melts the hand off. Okay. But it's not sticky feeling, and it's not sour tasting. But it has that same highly dangerous effect. What did we just discover? Bases. So we get acids and bases. Acids and bases have very similar reactivities or end results to the human body, unfortunately. Right? but with different kind of effects or how they're doing it. So we came up with ways to classify those compounds so that we could quickly evaluate them. Acids, sour tasting and sticky feeling. Bases, bitter tasting and slippery feeling. You ever, you know, swore too much? Like had an instructor that probably should stop swearing in, when being recorded? That would need to like get their mouth cleaned out? And they would shove soap in your mouth. What did that soap taste like? Yep. Bitter. Bitter. And it was slippery feeling. Guess what soap is? It's a base. Okay. So what we have access to is a lot of these different categories. We are exposed to acids and bases all over the place. Okay. Those high concerns that we've got with them are valid, but only at certain concentrations and particular acids okay, and bases. Okay? Because we've got these two categories, we might have said, well, I want to keep them separate from each other or separate from the water, so I don't go like, oh, let me drink some HCl. Oops, I thought that was water, and now I'm dead. Well, that's a bad idea. I want to set that aside somewhere else. Okay? Same deal with the base. I set it aside somewhere else so that I don't like ingest it. And then somebody accidentally knocked one over into the other one. And they mixed. And they neutralized. And they neutralized. That'd be great. Except what happens when they mix? It's like toxic gas. It's not toxic gas. We get a neutralization reaction. We get an acid-base reaction. That acid-base reaction releases massive amounts of heat. And so that if I'm storing these two chemicals near each other and they spill, I have a potential hazard. Right? So I want to be able to separate those compounds and classify them according to those different chemistries so that I know that when I'm going to go store my acids, what do I not store next to them? Bases. Bases. Right? Because our acids and bases come together in what type of reaction? A neutralization. Kind of, sort of? Yeah. They don't combust, do they? Okay. Just... No, 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 no. Don't call it combustion. Combustion is a reaction with oxygen. Okay? So these classes of chemicals were now so, I guess, obvious, if you will, that we came up with categories of ways to define them. One way we defined the acid was putting the hydrogen in front and the aqueous in back. Why did we care about the hydrogen? Well, it turned out the reactivity, the thing that makes an acid reactive, is hydrogen ion. So the first person to discover this was Arrhenius, and he defined acids as hydrogen ions. Okay? So if I add the species to water, do I get more hydrogen ions? If yes, that's now an acid. Then also went through and looked at bases and said, if I add this thing that I think is a base to the solution, if I get an increase in the concentration of hydroxide ions, OH minus, then I've got a base. This definition is ultimately way too narrow to be useful, but it is also the definition that is most commonly used through all of general chemistry. 
and we rely on it fairly heavily to do all of our calculations. So if you have to move through 151 or 152, this ends up being the definition that you work with. You can tell how high an opinion I have of it. Um, it is valid, but it's just too narrow. Okay? The next definition is our Bronsted-Lowry definition. So Bronsted and Lowry came through and said, well, we want to open this definition up because Arrhenius says that we have to add it to water. Well, is water the only liquid in the world? No. No. So there's other things. If I run a reaction in another solvent, could I still have an acid? Well, according to Arrhenius, no. Right? That's a pretty big issue. That's a pretty big gaping hole in the description of chemistry. So that's where Bronsted and Lowry, two independent chemists, came up with this new definition. This new definition still highlights the importance of the hydrogen ion right, for our acid, but it references now the base in reference to the hydrogen ion. What does that mean? Right. If we go through and take a look at this HCl, what do you think? Acid or base? Right. It doesn't have the AQ. I kind of sort of appreciate that comment. Just work with me. It has the H in front. We're looking at an acid. Right. So it's going to give us that H+. plus. How do we know it's going to give us H+. plus? What is the hydrogen connected to? Chlorine. What's special about chlorine? <clears throat> the electronegativity. Chlorine is so much more electronegative than hydrogen, then what does it do with the electrons in the bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine? It takes them away, thereby giving us H+. We had another compound up there that I asked about, right, and said, well, is methane an acid? And we said, no. Can we use that same understanding that we just did with HCl to explain why methane is not an acid? Chlorine takes the electrons away from hydrogen because it's more electronegative. It's more electronegative. What is the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen? It is basically zero. Why do you say it's basically zero? Because they just have very similar electronegativities. So you know their electronegativities. There you go. There's one answer to it. We know that the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is basically zero because what kind of bond is the bond between carbon and hydrogen? Nonpolar covalent. By definition, a zero difference in electronegativity. Okay. We could also look at the actual electronegativities and we would find that that is indeed true. Okay. The electronegativity difference between hydrogen and carbon is so small that we don't generate a sizable amount of H+. There is no partial positive hydrogen. If there's no H+, we don't have the acid. That's why CH4 is not an acid. Okay. Now let's go through and look at the other two. We have sodium hydroxide, which fits our Arrhenius definition. Because what is its supply? Hydroxide. But the one underneath, sodium amide, don't stress about the name. Does that give you hydroxide? No. no. Hydroxide is OH minus. There's no O there. So that couldn't possibly be a base. Okay. What happens to sodium hydroxide in the course of this reaction? Okay. Splits into ions, and it gives us hydroxide and sodium ion. What happens with the sodium amide? Same thing, we split into ions. We get N minus and Na plus, yeah? What did the hydroxide do in the reaction with the acid? It bound with the hydrogen ion. It bound with the hydrogen ion. So yes, it produced hydroxide. Ta-da, Arrhenius definition. It also bound to the hydrogen. If we look at the sodium amide, did I produce hydroxide? No. So that doesn't fit the Arrhenius definition. But what happened to that species in the course of this reaction? It bound, with the it bound with hydrogen. It accepted the hydrogen. What we've now just discovered is the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Bronsted-Lowry references acids as proton donors. 
We call them protons. What we're referencing is hydrogen ion. What is a hydrogen ion? H plus. H plus. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons does a hydrogen atom have? Okay. Nice list out. One, zero, one. One what? Proton. Proton, zero. Neutrons? One electron. One electron. If I have a hydrogen ion, how many electrons does it have? It would have to have... If we're a positive charge would have to have zero electrons. So what is the subatomic particles that make up a hydrogen ion? How many electrons does it have? Zero. 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 How many neutrons? Zero. zero. How many protons? One. One. Why might we call a hydrogen ion a proton? <laughs> it's literally what it is. It's just one proton. Okay. So when you hear reference to proton transfer, we're really talking about acids. Okay, proton transfer, that's an acid. It gave up a proton. When we look at the base, what is it going to do? It will accept that hydrogen ion. It will accept that proton. We've now expanded the definition ever so slightly. Okay? Our acid is a hydrogen ion donor or a proton donor. Our base is a hydrogen ion acceptor or a proton acceptor. This is a very subtle change in the definition, but it expands the definition enough that I can apply it to more chemicals. And the more I can apply it out, the better rule sets I can come up with to explain those reactions. Okay? And so that's what we get with our acids and bases. Are there more definitions that we can use? Yes, there's another tier on this. We could go all the way up to Lewis acids and bases. Lewis acids and bases, now instead of looking at atoms, look at electrons. That definition is so vastly more applicable that it applies to too many different things. Okay? And because of that, it gets largely ridicu ridiculed. Okay? And not really ridiculed, but just not used as often. Okay? You might wonder, Lewis... We've talked about Lewis before, right? Yeah, structures. yeah, Lewis structures. I mean, Lewis is a pretty common name. It turns out it's the same guy. The guy that came up with Lewis structures also came up with the definition of Lewis acids and bases. Right? Did, also didn't win a Nobel Prize for it, interestingly enough. What's that? It's almost like he studied it. It's almost like he looked at it a lot, yeah. Which is kind of true. So, that very first reaction at the top. What do you think is going to happen? Should I expect you to be able to predict products? You're like, hell no, that's not fair. What is an acid? Hydrogen in front and AQ in the back. Can this one act as an acid? No, so it's probably not going to be an acid. All right, how about the other one? Oh, it does have the hydrogen in front. You'll notice I didn't specify the phases. I do apologize for that. I should include that. Just pretend they all are aqueous. So we have an acid here. What do acids react with? Bases. So what do you think the SO3 minus 2 is going to be? A base. A base. What was our Bronsted-Lowry definition of a base? It accepts a proton. It accepts a proton. Okay, what charge is a proton? Positive. Positive. If I'm going to accept positive, what charge should I be? Why should I be negative? What are all our chemical reactions trying to do? Neutralize charge. So if I have an acid that's a big positive, I need to be a negative. Does my SO3 minus 2 have a negative charge? Yeah. Yes. All right. So let's run the reaction. What would the products be of this acid-base reaction? And before you get all too excited in this, single proton transfer. Only one hydrogen. Don't be doing crazy balancing stuff, just one hydrogen. What would you expect for the products? Okay. 
frantic writing. Amazing. Okay, H2O. Where'd you get H2O from? So you're going to um, donate a hydrogen from the acid. So you're gonna what is the definition of an acid? Somebody else. A H plus donor. What does that mean to the amount of hydrogens? It loses one. So if I get rid of one, back to our statement, you said water, and our formula becomes H2O. That was kind of funny, like H2O. It's late. What happened to the charge? Why is it neutral? We started positive, and what did I lose? I lost a positive. So it should become neutral. Okay. What is the definition of a base? An H plus acceptor. Which means when I draw that formula, what should I start with? H, because it has accepted it. What should be the rest of the formula? SO3. Okay. What should the charge be? Y minus. We started with a minus 2. We gained an H plus. The plus cancels one of the minuses, and we get HSO3 minus. For those of you potentially studying for the practice final, that compound would be known as? No. The hydrogen sulfite ion. Yeah, that was on the practice final, wasn't it? Okay, just checking. All right. We've now done our acid base reaction, we've predicted the product. Ta da! Would okay. the, the sulfate possibly take more than one hydrogen ion to balance it out to neutral? Could hydrogen sulfite take another hydrogen? No. To accept a hydrogen, what must it have? What is the charge of a hydrogen? Plus one. What do I need to be to accept that positive? Negative. A negative. Could hydrogen sulfite ion take another hydrogen? Yes. yes. Why do you know that? Because it's still negative. Because it's still negative. Could it do another one? Yes, it absolutely could. Could it do another one in the same reaction? Could it do another one in the same reaction is going to come to what level of the reaction you're looking at. In this case, all I've asked you to do is a single acid-base reaction. We just do it once. Okay. If we asked you to continue this out to its ex proper extent, that brings in another question. So the question that we're getting here is actually an interesting one, which is going to draw attention to the difference between the reaction shown here and the reactions we've talked about in the rest of the semester. What's that difference? You're like, I don't see any differences. It looks exactly the same. Nothing about this reaction looks different than what you've seen in other reactions. There's two arrows. What do those two arrows mean? It's reversible. This reaction can run in reverse. So the question that Mr. Garza is bringing up here is if we look at the reverse reaction, what must this water do? It must be a hydrogen ion acceptor, which means that species, that's a C, is acting as a base. But his question was, shouldn't the base have negative charge? It does not have to have negative charge. What must it have? Yeah. Where's the negative charge coming from? Yeah. Electrons. What must the structure have? Electrons. What does water have in it if we were to draw out the Lewis structure? Lone pair electrons. Those lone pair electrons could be used to make the bond to the hydrogen. So what we end up with is water now acts as a base to run the reverse reaction.
To run the reverse reaction, HSO3 minus has to act as? Has to act as an acid. Which species is the acid? Is the quiet because you're like, just shut up so I can leave? Or is the quiet because you're like, I don't know. You just wrote that there were two acids. First or second? It's the second. Okay. It is confusing to reference it. We want some way to clarify which one is acid and which one is not the acid that we're referencing. That way to clarify, giant freaking hint at the top of the slide. If it is a product, it becomes a conjugate. HSO3 minus is an acid. It is the conjugate acid. H2O is a base. It is the conjugate base. Conjugate base. Which one's the acid? H3O. H3O plus. Okay? It's a labeling system that allows us to clarify the reactivity of each of those pieces. What this now starts to bring in is that fun little aspect with the double arrow. I forgot that we had those stupid 20 minutes for those points back, so you better have earned them. Okay. We will be talking about that double arrow and what that ultimately means on Thursday. I'm going to try and burn content really fast on Thursday so we can actually do some practice.